Good afternoon, everybody. How's it going? Um, Science week, day four here. Um, <clears throat> in case you guys haven't been following along all week, we have been kind of discussing a lot of points. We have a lot to talk about in science with Trout Unlimited across the country, but we picked a few things that we could highlight this week. Uh, yesterday, uh, we had a cool discussion um, with Steve Moyer, our uh, d d d VP of Government Affairs and back east, and talked about how science influences some of the advocacy work that they do. Um, that was very cool. Thank you again, Steve, Mr. Moyer, for joining us live yesterday and to, and uh, day before we released uh, our film about Lahan Cutthroat Trout. So. If you haven't seen some of the work that Jason Barnes and Helen Neville and others within our science community have uh, worked on, um, go give that film a look, um, you know, after this, or I guess after this, we're releasing the, the other film. Um, but I encourage you to go check it out over at tu.org. Um, we have a whole host of uh, the blogs that we've, we've posted up this week, and we'd love for you guys to go give it a look. Um, and as always, uh, we appreciate your support. Uh, we love seeing you guys here. We love seeing um, people show up to watch some of these things and learn about the work that we do across the country and, and a lot of uh, what's possible via yourself out there too, the grassroots volunteers. So today, without further ado, we are going to chat with uh, Mr. Mark Hieronymus uh, up in Southeast Alaska. Um, Mark is uh, a guide. He's a self-proclaimed fish nerd. He um, lives, breathes, eats, and sleeps fish up in the up in the corners of Southeast Alaska. And he's working on some cool things um, with steelhead up there in the Tongass and uh, other reaches within Southeast Alaska too. So um, let me see if I can get Mark on the horn here. I thought I might have seen him but I'm not sure, so I need to get him uh, get him ready to rock. We might uh, give him a minute, too, and see if I can find him here. <clears throat> um, but in the meantime, um, check out the schedule tomorrow. We are going to go live from back east, which is going to be cool, too, with Jake Lemon, um, another member of the science crew, um, talking about his deployment of mayflies uh, sensor stations um, and Mark Taylor, our communications director from back east, will be uh, hosting that. So I encourage you guys to give a look there. I think it's going to be at 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, the schedule, again, is on tu.org. If you go to that main science blog that we posted at the beginning of the week, um, you should be able to see it. So um, that should be pretty cool too, to see what he's doing with volunteers back there, sampling eDNA to identify wild trout populations, things like that. So, um, Mark says he's on, are you on Instagram live, Mark? Uh, let's see here. Let's see. There he is. Let's, let's see if we. Um, I also encourage y'all to bring questions too, as well. Uh, Mark has a host of a wealth of information, um, and he is the right person to answer any and all questions about the work they're doing up there and with Steelhead. Um, so go ahead and fire away there, and we'll try to answer those as best as we can um, when Mark's on. So it looks like he's it's connecting. So we'll see see if we can get him on here while we're waiting. So while we're waiting, uh, grab yourself a coffee or whatever your midday drink of choice is here. It's pretty cold out here in Colorado right now. So I'm um, going the coffee route midday. Let's see, Mark, it says waiting. Let me see if I can connect with him here on the computer too. Uh, American Salmon Force is unable to join. Let's see if I can try it again. Multitasking today. Always something, right? Let's see if we can try again. Send a request. One of my favorite parts of uh, 
live sessions. It's trying to connect. It looks like it might have connected. There he is. So I had, I had my apparently my permissions. I had when I, I turned my camera off. So, yeah, that doesn't yeah, work. I'm not a millennial. <laughs> Oh, I love, I like the different levels of like, you know, technology proficient people within Shroud Unlimited that we can get on the horn here. So it's always something with these things. So yeah, I thought I read your instructions. I thought I had a pretty good grip on this whole thing. Turns out, nah. <laughs> well, you can always, you can always blame it on me, man. I'm a good, I'm, I'm a good person to blame things on. Um, I was just talking about you. We got Mark Hieronymus on here and uh, coming from sunny Southeast Alaska. Um, <laughs> it kind of looks, looks like that here in Colorado today. So um, how's things in your neck of the woods these days? Things are good. We're on one of those uh, early fall uh, northern. So everything's uh, cold as all get out. All the streams are freezing up. All the water's going away for the year. Snow. Uh, it snowed a couple days ago. You know, hung out for a little bit. So it's snow this weekend. Just standard southeast. You know. So I mean, fishing's kind of locked down for for a while, or how's that work? It depends on how bad you want it. You know, I mean, it. it in terms of you know, like fly fishing for for. Uh, Salmon, we're getting right into the end of it. There's still some runs of coho that you can uh, that you can chase around. There's always cutthroat and dollies that overwinter year round in the rivers. Um, you know, the lakes, the water's going to get pretty hard. You know, it's kind of a pain in the butt to cut a long enough trench to lay out a fly cap for your ice fishing. But uh, yeah, there's fish available to us year round. Once again, it just depends on how bad you need it. Right. How uh, how was your summer season this year? Well. I didn't guide a single client this year. Um, None? No, the first wow. time in the first time in um, in eighteen years as a uh, special angler that I did not pick a client out. Um, you know, for context, for comparison, a normal year for me is anywhere between three hundred and eighty-five or four hundred, and maybe you know, one year I did almost five hundred. Uh, you know, took out 500 guests out into the woods, you know, tromping around and fishing. And this year was none. So That was by design, just through the work that you've been doing, Mark? Uh, that, that was, that was more of, it was more of, you know, I'm still guiding in the summer times, um, but that was more of, uh, you know, related to our current state of affairs and the fact that a large part of uh, our business, the Bear Creek Outfitters business is, uh, is based on uh, cruise ship and we did Season this year. Yeah, yeah. So, what a different, what a different place it must have been this summer for sure. It was pretty strange, and we're we're just starting to, you know, there's there's some documentation, some of the effects. Um, there wasn't a real big hunting season in the spring, so there's a lot of bears. There's a community up north of us here that's having real issues with um, with the amount of bears. Just that we didn't have a a great salmon season to speak of. We had rather low returns, and so that and a combination of one of the wettest years on record around here that stunted dairy growth it made the bears pretty uh pretty hungry they're you know they're tearing up storage uh you know the little mini storage places and stuff right all right yeah. that changes it all um well i i guess i want to dive into this you know today we're 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 aiming to talk a little bit about the project you're working on and um after this after this discussion, we're going to have a, a release of a film. I got to, I had the great fortune with a few others to spend some time uh, with you a couple of years ago up in your neck of the woods um, to learn a little bit more about the work that you're doing for um, some of the streams within the Tongass in Southeast Alaska. And um, I kind of want to talk to start with uh, a little bit about, you know, your background, you know, you've guided, studied, you again, self-proclaimed fish nerd. Um, I love that about you. I, I, I just, I'm drawn to people. I think a lot of us are drawn to people that just have this wealth of knowledge and passion for what they do. And um, with you, you know, you've, you've kind of been there, done it all within the fish community. I, I believe you even said you worked at like a, a fish processing place at one point, right? Or am I mistaken there? And you no, you're not mistaken. Done it all. <laughs> 
Yeah, so you know, sport fishing, angling has always been a big, a big part of my life. You know, I grew up. Uh, my father was an incredible angler in the Pacific Northwest, and and uh, and so I grew up fishing with him, and and um, and, and learning about fish. He was also a a, a late like kind of like my approach to education. My, you know, I didn't go. I was a 28 year old incoming freshman in college, right? <laughs> and I had uh, completed his. Uh, fishery science degree when he was in his 40s right and so I got to attend a lot of those classes as a you know a single digit age kid right um, this strengthened our bond around around fishing and around fish you know right and my uncle both of my uncles uh were in commercial fisheries and that was my first my first foray you know I, I there's a line in the film I think I, I've repeated it in more than one interview you know I can't think of too much money in my life that hasn't you know doesn't derive directly from fish right you know, in, in 1988 1987 I came up uh to Alaska and spent a winter in the Bering Sea decided I never needed to do that again <laughs> it kind of started me into uh, the commercial fishing and seafood processing realm and uh, I spent 25 seasons doing that. And, you know, I started out as a, as a puker, you know, as a slime line guy on a, on a processing boat and had enough working knowledge of, of, of boats and of, of the fishing industry to work in the, the offloader position really quick. But I didn't have to be inside working on a slime line. Nice. Uh, and then sort of progressed through a couple fisheries from there. You know, I, I, uh, I fished uh, salmon in Cook Inlet. I fished uh, ground fish down here in Southeast. I fished uh, halibut long line, uh, black cod long line, uh, crab and shrimp down here, and uh, salmon gillnet as well. And what I would do in the winter times, I would come up and I would fish in the summer, and then I would try to work out the ideal schedule where I could just fish my way. I lived in Seattle at that time, and I could try to fish my way around the Olympic Peninsula and all the steelhead streams all winter, you know, just stay in the back of my truck and, and uh, you know, eat gas station food, kind of. Um, <laughs> but I uh, I ended up meeting some folks. I had a very a very specific training path in seafood. I was fortunate enough to work with uh, with some uh, amazing caviar makers, some amazing uh, row processors. And uh, in 1993, well, in 1992, really, a group of uh, four of us, the four four folks that were in the fishing community here in Southeast, started a processing company. And we ran that for 19 years. You know, I, I was a partner in and, and operations manager of uh, a facility here in Juneau and um, yeah I did that until my body really couldn't take it anymore it's demanding physical labor and uh, right and your name if you're an employee you can just send somebody home but if your name's on the package it's got to be done right and it's got to be done and and so the other the other partner that, that I had that was also a road tech we we put in you know we used to joke about we do a half an opening every week but there was at least one week out of the out of the uh processing we did we'd work for 24 hours sometimes 28 hours in the day just oh it's not and so that's you know my my the the from a fishery standpoint my the breadth of my experience goes across commercial fisheries you know right but during the time during the time in the processing community i had opportunities on the shoulder season you know may our steelhead run starts up in some cases in march up here and so i had this little bit of time Spent a lot of time fishing during that period, but then I was also asked to uh, fill in for one of the local guide services, and that was 18 years ago. And, and when I sold the business, I immediately transitioned to full-time guide. You know, right, so. right. And so, <laughs> what led you to Trout Unlimited, and how did that? Uh, what, how did you ultimately land where you are now? And I guess like talk a little bit about uh, the role that you have, and that's kind of changed even over the last few years as well, right? Oh yeah. Um, so I came to Trout Unlimited first as a volunteer, um, very early on in the in the uh, in the Bristol Bay in the Pebble campaign. Um, the then director of the Alaska program was Tim Bristol, and uh, he asked me if I would like to go out to sport shows because I speak fly fishing and I speak you know salmon fluently. Right. right. So if I could, if he he asked me if I wanted to go out to the sport shows, talk to folks about Pebble and what we stand to lose up there. If, you know, if, if things progress on the mine side. And uh, I, I kind of thought about it. I was like, yeah, maybe that, that might be interesting. And then um, coincidentally, that first summer, I think it was the summer of 2006 or 2007, I got a call from a, uh, you know, I was still processing at that time. We, my process up until 2012 or 2011. And uh, 
we got a call from a customer who was asking us about this big mine project and what it was going to mean to our quality and, and were we going to be able to get this. And all of a sudden, this was immensely real for me because this wasn't just, and I don't mean this, I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but this just was, wasn't one dude jumping around on a fly rod, you know, yelling about trout opportunity. This is a multi-billion dollar business, uh, salmon and seafood in general in Alaska, and any image tarnishment. You know, we spent a long time, you know, working on that image worldwide. And right. Any tarnishment, any tarnishment drags everything sound. I, the next call I made was to Tim and I said, sign me up, man. I need to, you know, we need to talk to people about this. I can't believe that this doesn't get more coverage. Right. I ended up, I ended up going out to sports shows, paying my own way to sports shows and paying my own, you know, paying all these things and then coming back and shoving across a pile of receipts just for reimbursement, not for my time. This is all right. volunteer. I did, I think I did, I think I did 50 shows, right around 50 shows for the Bristol Bay campaign. Wow. As, as a 100% volunteer. And that was all down in the lower 48? Almost all down in the lower 48. I did some, the Great Alaska Sports Show, but then, you know, the Alachlan shows in, in, um, in you know, the Hook and Bullet shows in, in the Pacific Northwest, IFE shows from you know Denver all the way back to the west coast uh right. smaller sh put on road shows all kinds of stuff you know spent in some cases spent 60 or 70 days on the road a year talking to people about this and the impact the potential impacts of what we stand to lose you know and, right and so when when it came time to transition out of the seafood world I built up a pretty good road deck by that time and and felt I had some utility in Trout Unlimited as, a, as an advocacy and outreach person. And um, by this time, here's the weird coincidence and the small world side of Alaska thing. By that time, Mark Kelke, our, our former Southeast director who you met. Yeah. yeah. So uh, for everybody out there, Mark Kelke, he owned the guide service that I worked for when I started in 2003. He left in 2007 to come work for Trout Unlimited. I came in 2011 and said, well, do you have any need for an outreach and advocacy fellow? And turns out he did. And so I actually worked on contract um, for the first two years and, and then moved into the, uh, basically into the structure that I'm in now, which is part-time, um, you know, there's a seasonal wiggle room. I, I still get to pursue my, my vocation and passion as a guide, you know, right. telling, taking people out without the, you know, without trying to get a, an, an ask in front of them or a sell past them, just telling them, look, just come out and enjoy this place. You know, this is the greatest place on earth. All right. So, that's the art that got me to about 2018. And if you want, we can continue into the, you know, the, the transition from outreach to, to. Well, I guess, yeah, I guess I'm just curious. And I think others probably should know a little bit about like, what it is you're doing now up there and like what your focus is for Trout Unlimited and especially in the, in the relationship that we're working within science um, right now um, would be interesting, I think, to chat about real quick. Well, the, the my, excuse me, my, uh, my baby, my pet project now is the Fish Habitat Project. And, um, if there was an elevator speech for it, it would, it would just say, you know, I'm working to document um, un and under documented water bodies in, in Southeast Alaska. And what I mean by that is that um, there's not all, not all the anatomous rivers that we have up here are, are documented as containing anatomous habitat or supporting anatomous species. And a lot of the ones that are documented, uh, the full assemblage, the full group of species that use that habitat often isn't accounted for. Right. And, and so that's, in a nutshell, that's what I do. Right, right. But that, I think that uh, almost oversimplifies it because if you ever spend a day with Mark out in these streams, uh, you realize uh, it's more of like a butt kicking, um, uh, extreme adventure every time you go out, you know, to, to do this work uh, that you're doing right now. And I mean, I, I just, I, I can't, I can't imagine the scope of what you've seen and what you've done in regards to this project that I only spent a few days. So um, with that, I mean, a lot of this is taking place within the Tongass 
uh, national forest, correct? Yeah, the Tongass, so the Tongass is the largest block of land here in Southeast. We're about, mm, the top, well, let's put it this way. The Tongass represents about 80% of the land mass down here. Right. You're mine. It's everybody's that's, you know, watching in on this. It's all ours. It's this amazing national treasure. Right. Loaded with fish streams. And there's not, you know, we, we don't have a complete picture. You know, we've got some really good assumptions. There's some really robust data sets, some really good monitoring that's going on, but we don't have a full complete picture of what's actually out there. Right. That's, that's what I'm doing is, is filling in those, filling in those gaps. Now this job, the, the, the actual filling in is uh, mandated by law by uh, for fish and game to undertake the Alaska statute, right? All these areas, I guess this is a great time to segue into the AWC. Yeah, I was gonna, yeah. Keep the nerve level like really low because we could just, I mean, this is a long and winding road here. I know, I know. <laughs> I'll, try to, I'll try to keep it as brief, you know, I'll try to focus on the brevity and, and the larger points of this. But yeah, anadromous waters in Alaska. And so let's just talk about Southeast. That's specifically where I'm dealing with. Right. There's about 5,000 anadromous streams in Southeast Alaska. Uh, these streams are documented in what's called uh, the AWC, which is the, the acronym for Anatomous Water Catalog, which is the shorthand for the catalog of waters important to the spawning, rearing, or migration of anatomous fish and its accompanying atlas. Now, that's a huge mouthful. <laughs> but what that is, is the, ex, the document of, of updated, as current as one year, and extant observations of habitat use, uh, of rivers and what uh, rivers and lakes by anadromous species. Right. The significance of this document is is Alaska has an anadromous fish law, title laws that that dictate what can and can't happen within a riparian area or the wetted area of a stream, and what you need a fish habitat permit for and what you don't need a permit for. And the AWC was designed as a or is at least functioning as a guide to what's in there. And so you can make assumptions on when you can actually go into an area and work and when there's going to be fish present and using the habitat and when that presence may be sensitive, right? Right. So the rub here, the, you know, the crux of this whole thing is the AWC is nowhere near complete. And, you know, Alaska Fish and Game, by their own admission, says probably 50% of the water in Southeast, 50% of the anatomous habitat in Southeast is actually accounted for. Right. Um, and that's just and, by, by budget constraints or uh, things like that you've said and mentioned, I guess? Yeah, that's a lot. You know, there's, and I, I kind of want to point this out really briefly. In the movie, I, I, I may have come off as, as you know, and I, I was a little angry at Fishing Game. I may have come off as angry at them, but they're not the villain in this. It's a funding issue. You know, it's right. in, in, in the Department of Habitat, which is the one that, the Division of Habitat in, in BFG, which is charged with, updating and maintaining the AWC. They're fully funded or permitted. They actually have to compete for some of the same grant money that we at PU compete for for projects to continue their research to document habitat. I'll just let that sink in for a moment. A state agency right. has to grant money to That's define crazy. areas that should be defined by law. I'm that's wild. Just, it is what it is, but but that's that's something that you know we we should be looking forward on how to change that. But right. in the meantime, these areas still need conservation measures for it, right? Right. But so the long short of it, the long and short of it is that if if a if a species isn't listed in a particular water body or as occurring as occurring or using that habitat, then there aren't basic conservation measures as provided by Alaska state law for that species. Right. And, to, there's a lot of ways you could look at that, but to me, it's, it's kind of unconscionable, especially on a on you know the, the way that our state operates, the way that Alaska operates is the bulk of the time, effort, and, and funding is directed at commercial fisheries because that's the money maker. And sport fisheries generally, you know, they get a modicum of, of funding. They get enough to keep the lights on in a lot of cases. But an example, you know, for an example, the steelhead research, you know, for lack of a better word, the, the observations that I'm making now used to be part and partial of, you know, the standard 
that was a standard fishing game habitat. You know, they had they had all kinds of studies going on on steelhead. Um, there there used to be a, a fairly you know robust program of of trout research. The funding dried up for that in in the early 20 teens, and by 2013 that program was gone. And right now, as it sits, 2019 we're on the cusp of maybe seeing the rest, the complete collapse of the trout research program in Southeast Alaska. That's crazy. So, so in this case, go ahead, sorry. No, I was just gonna say, and so you, you've been able to kind of like say, you know, and you mentioned this in the film, it's like, well, you know, like I see this gap, I see what's happening. You know, I have an opportunity as Mark Hieronymus and Trout Unlimited, I have an opportunity to kind of correct this in a sense of like help out um, the agency and other partners and finding out, you know, you know, where you can, where you can make these, these um, adjustments or you can get to these streams and find these additions and fill in these gaps that they may have. And I mean, you have a long road to haul, man. Like uh, that's not a small task. <laughs> no, it's not. And that's, you know, I think I, the other thing that I always say in these, you know, when I'm writing about this and when we're, even in the movie, I mean, it's like a broken record. You know, the work is just begun. The work has just begun because nobody else is going to do it. Fishing game doesn't necessarily need to go back into a place that they've already surveyed. Most of the time, habitat right. stands right in front of the bulldozers. And I mean that, you know, I, that's a, a, an alliterate or a, what a, a metaphor. You know, yeah. if, the place, you know the, if there's a place that might be included in a land transfer or say a logging sale or something like that, they're most interested in what they have missed first in those areas. And I fully support that. That's where they need to be going and doing that work. But there's only what, eight habitat biologists in all of Southeast Alaska and they're tasked with not only the research, but the permitting into that too. So, right. You know, that, and you said it perfectly. It's a, it's a gap. And I, I feel this is, TU has the, 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 the base, you know, the, the nimbleness, the strong base, but the nimbleness to find these little gaps in in data streams that are wildly important and fill them and provide information back to these agencies in 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 both formal and informal collaboration you know i've collaborated with the uh with the forest service on steelhead surveys um through our national forest service agreement mm -hmm. uh, to you and, and usf or to and usda um, I've got an informal data sharing agreement right now with the local habitat office. We defined a, a, a larger, you know, a codified collaboration because we felt it would be in our best interest just to, to collaborate where, you know, where we found a synergy. So yeah, these are, you know, we're, it's, it's not just about making your fishing better. It's about making agencies' lives easier and making the data more accessible. We're just making, you know, gathering that data in the first place. And I like, um, you mentioned in your blog today too, and I've heard you talk about this in the past, is, uh, you know, these fish, uh, in your case, in this specific instance, it's steelhead you're focused on. Um, they, get, they get put onto this catalog, but they're not, it doesn't block development completely from happening because, I mean, ultimately we're not there to just shut it down, um, no. but it does stop it at, at critical moments, right? Whether that's spawn or um, any kind of migration or, or things like that, right? So, I mean, it has a, it's not a total, you know, stop it all, stop all development kind of. No, no, not, not by, I wouldn't support that. It's not, that's not the goal of this. The goal of this is to have, is to make a document that's robust enough to, you know, to provide enough information in there that, so that it informs land management decisions. It informs permitting decisions. It informs development decisions, so that all of these things are weighed. But fish have to be weighed on the balance. You cannot, you cannot take that element out and say, "Oh, we'll just mitigate against that." Oh, we'll just do this work over here and call it good. Oh, we'll put in a hatchery. That's that is the antithetical portion of that. I'm not against development. Trout Unlimited, in general, we're not against development, especially here. Right. It's you. you there's a time and a place, and that's that's the focus. Of the of of getting these fish in the AWC is making sure because is, is there something on the immediate horizon? Probably not. Is there something on the horizon in 25 years? I don't know. In 100 years, but once you put it there, it establishes that species occurring in that watershed, and then from there we go out 
you know, all I'm doing is basically, I hate that. I'm not going to say that word again. All I'm doing is looking at that. Yeah. <laughs> Everything else, you know, it, it takes, it takes multiple years, multiple, multiple, uh, you know, site visits to determine the extent of that habitat use. I'm just saying, are they using the habitat or not? You know, so once right. we get that, once we get that information, then that provides a very clear picture so that there isn't a conflict in between development and fish so that we, they, everybody understands the rules and where, where they have to stay away from and what time they have to stay away from. And I feel that that is, is hugely important. Right. Right. And, um, you know, when you set out to do this, um, I don't know if I ever got to the original reason why this kind of came to be, right? Right? Like, I don't know if it was like you were out with a client and you noticed some fish in a place that, and then you put that all back together when you started looking at some of the documents back at home. Um, but maybe talk about like, how the heck does this come to be? Was it like a light bulb moment where it was like all of a sudden, you're like, wait, why aren't we putting this together? <laughs> Man, if, if it was a light bulb moment, it would be the longest flickering light bulb in the world with all the signs going off and me just kind of scratching my head going, what is it all? And until basically the watershed moment in 2018 where we decided to just go for it. Right. But yeah, what you described is pretty much how I came to this because I used to think the AWC was the end all. I had this document. I had, I was in position. I thought that nobody else could find it, right? And right. It's on an interactive map viewer on a state fishing game site. It's a beautiful tool. And I used to use it as such. I used to say, God, you know, I wonder, I wonder if there's this species over here. I wonder where's a new place to fish. Hey, let's go, you know, let's go look for it and we'll figure it out on the AWC, right? But then the right. more I spent on the landscape in southeast Alaska, and you know, I was thinking about that this morning. I think, there's not too many river valleys in a in a 80 mile circumference here that I haven't stomped up and down at least a hundred times, right? And so in my travels, I started to, you know, at, in the, not necessarily just travel and looking, but travel with paying clients and expected to get fish. And we'd come up with all kinds of species, and then I'd look and you know, often casually I'd look at the AWC and then I'd say, hmm, that's not there. Wonder why? Yeah. So. One of the things that we started noticing, we, uh, Mark Kelke and I started noticing is that there were a lot of places that steelhead were found in Southeast Alaska that were not listed in the AWC. I can think of 20 streams off the top of my head, you know, several that I guide paying clients with, you know, for right. steel, with the intention of chasing steelhead. <laughs> there, they're not listed. That's and, wild. And that it, that is when the angler, the angler in me and the conservationist in me started having this button heads argument because steelheaders, man, come on. You know, if there's a bigger group of lion dirt bag, I mean, it's just, you know, when the fishing's hot or if you got a good spot, you'd lie to your mom. I mean, <laughs> they'd be looking, if, if you didn't come home, they'd be looking at a whole nother river, right? Because you, you're like, oh, I'm not going there. You know? And so the secrecy that surrounds them. Right. It, it took me a while to bridge, and now it's an instantaneous bridge because if they don't, if nobody knows that, two things: if nobody knows they're there, they don't get any kind of conservation measure. And right. number two, you know, it's one of the, it's one of the basic principles of fisheries science. Fisheries management is know your stock distribution. Right. If you don't know it's there, you can't manage it. Right. Right. And so, so those things started to outweigh my my dirt bag lie to everybody about where I was, you know, um, and, and that eventually won out. And I still, I'm still fairly secretive. I do, I actually do, uh, when I go out on the, on the road shows in non COVID years, I have an hour long presentation on steelhead fishing in Southeast Alaska. And the first thing I tell people is, you know, I'll tell you everything you need to know from an angler's perspective on the biology of this fish, so you can make an informed decision on where to find them. What you're never going to hear escape my lips is the name of a river to fish. Right. And people get mad, but I'm, you know, I, I am, I firmly, as a, one of those dirtbag steel editors, you know, I, I think that, that they're, they're a fish that's too special that you have to earn them. Right. Well, you saw it. 
What did yeah. you think? I told you guys beforehand, I said, it's going to be kind of like a backcountry elk hunt. And there's right. going to be times you may want to try it privately. And there might be times where you're just thinking, this is just, what are we doing here? And that's the difference I've noticed. I'm not a steelhead angler. I live in trout country here, but I've been on enough trips and heading out next week to the Grand Ronde uh for a steelhead uh project uh but um ultimately like these streams are not traditional steelhead streams right like in a lot of places they're well i mean i guess the ones that i always picture you know the big big ones where you're you know yeah. casting you know halfway across the dang river these are these are burly you know crawl under logs and grab devil's club and that's what it looks like. <laughs> That's what it looks like, man. It's a jungle. It's not. It's not easy. You don't drive your, you know, you don't drive your car or your pickup to the turnout, right? And, and walk a hundred foot trail down to the river and move around. You, you land usually. You know, if you're in, if you're in a non lake based system, you land at saltwater, and you put the hoof on. Right. And there's the only trails that you you remember those big u-shaped trails those <laughs> yeah. are bear bottoms and yeah. that's what's in those trails they're salmon streams as well so the bears are pushing that you know there's a little depression where that thousand pounds of animal is walking all day right. we're just following bear trails to get around and when the bear trails peter out you know you're on your own man right good luck <laughs> it's a brutal it's a brutal landscape and and you know it's a blessing and a curse because that keeps a lot of people, you know, it keeps those of lesser faith and conviction definitely out of the way. But but right. if you want if you want it, they're up here, you know. Right, right. And hopefully, you know, continually. And I, I guess, you know, when we went, uh, you mentioned this as well in your blog, but it's worth pointing out that like I think it's a testament to your persistence is uh, you know, the first day we didn't see anything, you know, and like we got we we busted our butts all day um i learned about the joys of crawling through some of that and um we busted our butts all day and we came back you know not having documented these fish not having caught these fish and it's not just about catching the fish i mean part of the project you're working on is less about fishing and it's definitely more about documentation of these fish in the river um we didn't see anything what was going on in your head there you know uh, there are things that particular basin that we are in that the end of the end of that particular region is kind of known as an ice box and and the our timing wasn't the best our timing was our timing was pretty much when we had all four you know the uh, I do actually want to take the time right now and give a shout out to uh, Braden Hopkins and Jamie Brown for yeah for you know their incredible donation of, of financing that trip and basically kickstarting this whole program you know fantastic support we wouldn't be where we are right now without those guys basically pushing us off the cliff and saying well here it is you had an idea go do it but i'll give them credit too because they busted their butts with us through all that gnarly stuff too <laughs> yeah no and they're you know they they're way tougher than i am man because they, <laughs> <laughs> but you know that 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 so we we weren't there at a at a at an optimum time. We didn't get a chance to revisit it. You know, we didn't get a chance to to do anything but angle. And now I, I do want to speak to the development of the project and the development of, of what we're doing and our and our techniques because it started out three dudes with fly rods. Well, how do you? That's where we arrived at. How do you how do you get there? What are the easiest ways to tell that they're still in the system? Right. You got a lot of ways to do it. They cost time, money, or man effort, right? <laughs> it's effective way is to put up a weir just out of tide water, make it a fish tight weir, go out there and camp for a month, count how many steel it go up, and see if any steel it go at all. Right. Incredibly expensive. <laughs> right. And, and that's why fishing game doesn't do that anymore. They can't afford it, right? Right. The second way you can do it is uh snorkel survey which is what fishing game uses as their monitoring their steelhead monitoring program right now and that's something that we're going to start adopting into our program in 2021 the last way the shoestring way and the way that i know um best is steelhead you know they, they have got this habit of biting they, they're when they're there they're they're bitey fish and so in order to get the presence of steelhead versus rainbow trout you have to get an adult 
reckoning, by Fish and Game's reckoning, that's anything over 23 inches. Any rainbow trout that you find in, a, in an unbarriered, you know, if it's got a clean entry to salt water uh, and you find it in an anatomous stream, that's a steelhead and it's a size determination. You know, right. more they go over, but that's the first hurdle, you know. And so the easiest way to get that was to go take a fishing rod and you know you see in the video i had my spin rod my little jig rod and those guys you know had fly gear but just go in and if you can't see into a hole fish it go poke around in it you know maybe poke a stick in there and see what's there and then if there's nothing there keep moving and you just happen to see the you know that snapshot that one day snapshot of that first stream was what happens when there's no steelhead you know, right that's that's what you get, but is that information? Can you use that information? Certainly, it's data. You know, there weren't there weren't there any on, there weren't any there on that day. Uh, is it too early? It might be. Water conditions? Is it too cold still for their for their, you know, spawning migration? It might have been. Right. There's a lot of information you can get from that. So not all blanks are bad. You know what I mean? Right. 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 But since then, what we've done is is we rely a lot less on the fishing rods and and. I don't necessarily bristle when somebody says, oh, it's just a fishing trip, but I kind of say, well, it's a lot more than a fishing trip. It takes a lot of predictive modeling to get to the spot of finding, you know, saying, hey, we're going to go out and look at this spot because, you know, here are the reasons why. Right. And then once we get there, we found that the easiest way to do this is um, just in situ photography, just underwater photography, where we can get close enough to them. And, and we started, instead of walking on the sides, on the margins and stalking them like we would if we were fishing, we started walking straight in the river. You know, just kicking feet under log jams, pushing around, you know, safety in mind. But, you know, anywhere you can get to walk so you can see it. If you flush a fish out, back up, let it settle, make a plan on how you're going to get in there and document it, you know. So that's that's kind of the focus now. And then as I alluded to, we're, we're you know, I'm in the process of, of building this out slowly on the successes that we've had. But one of the elements that we're going to be adding is that snorkel survey. And so we'll pack along a dry suit, a snorkel get up. We'll do our do our visual survey on the way up, uh, you know, the visual foot survey and the you know occasional cast here and there. But if we reach a probable barrier to anatomy or the end of anatomy and don't see anything, then hop in the dry suit, go back down, making sure that you're getting a good look into all the habitat. Because the way we're doing it now, you you get one, you know, you saw how small the season is. It's roughly, you know, 21 to 30 days. You might get one bite at that apple per year, and so you got to make the best of your time when you're there. Right, right. And now, so what? Uh, you know, speaking to that, you know, what? What can other folks do to aid you? You and I have kind of, you know, you've tossed around the idea of the community science portion of this. I mean, is that a viable option in something like this? And I guess what I mean by that, I think to clarify for folks watching is, you know, if I'm out there doing my thing and I happen to be on a stream and I see something, do I relay that info back to you? Is that useful? Like, are you using that at all with some of your fellow guides, uh, friends, uh, people that are out there like yourself? Yes, we've got, uh, so if you go to americansalmonforest.org, there's community science tab. Uh, I believe that the story, the blog post that I did, I think we put a link in there to it. But I do, I do actually have, you described exactly what I've been fostering, a community that I've, I've, been, I've been growing from the ground up. I've got about a half a dozen guides now that I get regular phone calls, you know, it, either asking me for information, which I'm more than happy to share with them, um, or my, you know, asking what I think of the potential of a certain watershed or calling to tell me, hey, I think we may have found another one. And so I outline on that page what you need to do in order to document these. And I can help, you know, I can help people walk them through the process. I cannot submit something. I will not submit something for somebody else. I, I can do preparation. I can give, you know, if you have coordinates, I can do all the mapping uh, and, and make a, a document that would be useful to fish and game. Right. And it's on you to submit it and sign your name to it because you're the one that saw it. It's not me. It's not my nomination. Right. But yeah, great. It, this, this particular effort and expanded out from steelhead into other adult salmonids is a, is a great community science opportunity. Because like I was saying earlier, there's so many places, you know, so many waters that we have that the assemblage isn't complete. You know, and as an example, 
um, I added uh, three pink salmon streams or pink salmon, just three, it's a, a, the assemblage, my words all mixed up. I added pink salmon to three streams this year to the assemblage of three streams just by looking off the freeway or off the highway while I was driving, seeing a pink salmon, turning around, grabbing my fishing rod out of the back, going down to the highest place in the stream where I could find a pink salmon, catching that salmon, taking a picture of it with my cell phone, <laughs> recording the, the GPS coordinates of where I got that fish. And then when I got home, I made a one station nomination. I said, I saw two pink salmon right here. Here's the pictures. Here's the map of the stream. Here's where they occur. Right. I think that that it, the engagement barrier for this in terms of community science is is incredibly low it just it's it comes back to especially when we're talking about steel it comes back to that secrecy issue and that's right. the hurdle that, that that's i i think that steel editors in general are going to have to get one over that one right quick and in a hurry because we're facing a time of unprecedented stock collapse up and down the coast it, it may be leaking into Alaska. So far, we're bulwarked against that. But there's going to be a time where you won't be able to talk about your secret spot because it doesn't have fish anymore. Right. And, and it's incumbent upon all of us as users of these resources to, to, to put in at least what we take out, right? Right. If we got a tenth of the effort that some guys put in to do their steelhead camps and stuff like that, we'd never have another issue in the world. Right. But it, it takes buy-in from the community. I can I can frame up a citizen science program or a community science program all I want. And with the hopes that if you build it, they will come. But people have to see the value in that. And I think, I, you know, I kind of posed that it sort of clumsily at the end of the movie. I said, is this valuable to society? What is society in general? What do people at large think about this? Is this something that matters to you and right. hopefully the answer is yeah we could all hope um well with that um i won't keep you too much longer but i guess i'm curious about you know where this is going you know we're looking at 2021 season coming ahead and and on i mean is this program build up enough steam for you and uh your partners there that you're going to continue on with this is this just going to keep going and getting bigger um, yeah, I'd be curious to know. Yeah, well, that's in the movie too. Now what? You know, <laughs> right? That, and that the now what was then, and now what we have is 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 a little bit more than a nascent. You know, we've got more than just a nascent program. Um, so far, the, the uh, Fish Habitat Project has added over two hundred and fifteen thousand feet of anatomous fish habitat to the AWC, almost, you know, nearly 40 or over 40 miles of fish habitat. Right. In 2018, we branched out into uh, juvenile surveys. I actually partnered with the, uh, with the Forest Service to receive uh, electroshocker training, and then they loaned me one of them uh, Smith Route 24s for, yeah. for zap fish. Yeah. Uh, I took two days and, and took one other fella, and we went out and cataloged cohos in, in uh, 13 streams in two days. And we added, this is the cool thing. This is why I like this portion of the project so much more. I love the steelhead side, but man, this one really turns my crank because we got to draw a blue line. You know, they were on, these blue lines are on, some of them are on the national hydrography data set. So some are on the NHD. They were, some of them were uh, known to the forest service, but they weren't in the AWC. All right. So we got, we went out there, uh, did our minnow trapping, captured the fish, made our observations, did everything very carefully and very coordinated, came back, mapped them out, and put blue lines on a map that weren't there before. And I've since gone on to add more than 15 waters. Several of them, my, my recent thing that's so much fun is actually finding waters where they're not listed by USGS, fishing game, any state or federal agency. Nobody knows there's water there except for maybe Somebody that's wandering around in the woods. Like last Saturday, I was wandering around the woods with my gun hunting right over here. There's a tributary to a stream. It's not on any map. It's not on any, it's not on any GIS layer. It's nowhere. Right. So we have so much of that up here that one fellow who's determining them with the, you know, with the right, with the right tools for it, with the, the minnow traps, the, you know, fish ID card, you know, an, an understanding of, of how to do survey protocols. 
you know, you can, if you've got the local knowledge, you can knock out quite a bit of habitat right quick and in a hurry. And that's, that's what I've been doing. And that is what, once again, I, you know, I, I steelhead, I like steelhead. I'd rather actually document steelhead than go steelhead fishing. If that'll right. tell you how much <laughs> but when it comes to these, finding these places that weren't on anybody's radar, that to me is the, that's the reward that will be there. And it right. will be there for the TU's work. And so that, I find that, ex that's, that's what I'm all about right now. So. Sure. Well, that's cool. And I, and I, I'd, I'd be, you know, I'd be, I'd be not doing us a favor if I didn't mention that these projects and many others within the science community of Trout Unlimited, um, you know, they need funding and they need support, you know, and if anyone feels, you know, motivated, particularly after watching this film or talk, listening to this talk or any of the others that we've talked about, like, I encourage people to get on and you know, do the, you know, this is my sales pitch, but do the donation thing, man. I mean, it matters to you. And if you feel like you can't physically get out there to help Mark, you know, there's other ways to do that. And like, you know, we rely on that and like to continue this great work, like it's, it's critical. And um, so I guess that's my sales pitch there. Um, I do um, want to, I want to take a break and shout out to Umqua Feather Merchants because they gave us this tremendous gift. To, that's uh, right very large financial donation. The donation was originally earmarked to do, excuse me, was originally earmarked to do habitat restoration. And, and we, long story short, we were unable to find a, a, a proper fit project. And so in 2019, we asked Umqua if they would mind if we moved the donation to, to support this work. And they're all for it. And so Umqua has, you know, Umqua has put their foot down and it's just up to everybody else, you know, to, you know, to, to see the value in this, especially those in the fishing community and the manufacturing and gear communities. If we don't support our fisheries, the business model flawed. You know? I agree. And whether that's through supporting folks like Umqua um, and, you know, doing things like that, you know, that's, that's a, a good way to help support the work that's being done. And um, I guess with that, like, uh, I want to thank you for your time, Mark. It's been a couple of years since I've seen you and I'm stoked to kind of learn more about what's going to happen. I presume that we're going to, you know, put out more information as this kind of unfolds over the next, you know, many years, couple of years. I don't know how long it'll take, you know, it seems like it could be a lifetime, but, you know, ultimately, like, I'd love to keep updated and I thank you for your hard work and efforts and what you're doing up there. Um, I encourage everybody to get up and, you know, visit and find your streams up there too. It's pretty, pretty special place. So, uh, yeah. Also, if you're remiss, I think we'd both be remiss if we didn't, uh, give a shout out to Wild Steel Letters United here too, because they were, they were part of the initial, you know, they were the ones that connected, uh, the Alaska program to the funders. And so, um, if you guys are, if, if everybody, uh, to go over to Wild Steel Headers at Wild Steel Headers on Instagram and slash the follow button. That'd be a, that'd be great. Yeah, they, I give them a follow. They've got oh, a yeah. new sh online shop. You can buy some swag, you know, some represent. And you get, you get McMillan, you get John McMillan, who is, I mean, his little pinky toe has forgotten more about Steelhead than I'll ever know. And that guy, I mean, it's just, he is such a wealth. It's so amazing to have him working with Trout Unlimited. Very true. We've we've got some of the most incredible people doing what they do, uh, and and y'all are y'all are some of them, man. And just a small slice of it too. And I, I can't wait to learn more. So thanks again, Mark. And uh, film is going to launch here in about uh, six minutes. So give it a look. Let us know what you think. Uh, and Mark, if anybody has any questions on here, they can either send me a message on Instagram at Trout Unlimited or the Salmon Forest. Uh, a Salmon Forest uh, Instagram channel, Steelheaders channel, or they can uh, look for you uh, in the contacts uh, on a website and send you an email, yeah? Yes, yeah, I'm Mark Dart Hieronymus, tough name to spell, at tu.org, but yeah, it's... Um, I, you got you yeah. to earn it. Cool, it's searchable in the direct, it's easy to find on tu.org. Yeah, cool, man. So. Well, thank you for your time, Mark. We appreciate you and all that you do, and uh, look forward to talking again. Right on, Josh. Thanks a whole bunch. We'll see you soon. All right. Be well. Bye-bye.